We are in Ephesians chapter 4, um, and we're going to look at two verses, verses 29 and 30 this morning. And by the way, while I'm gone on vacation, we're going to get a chance to hear from uh, some leaders we don't normally get to hear from here at Redemption. So our student guys, our, our Redemption kids, and our adult ministry men will all be preaching while I'm away. So that's uh, Brian and Jeremy and Ryan and Matt and Justin will get a chance. So uh, we're going to continue on in our Ephesians series, and they'll take a piece of that and, and plow through, and uh, we'll be back in a little while, yeah? So encourage these men. These are part of what makes our church great, beyond me telling you last week I love you and you make it great, these guys make it great. So I'm really excited for them. All right, you got it? Ephesians 4. This is an uh, easy statement to make. All sin is a problem, yes? All sin is a problem. But if you had to pick, if you had to pick one particular sin um, that creates more mess than anything else, what would you pick? Now, leave pride alone because pride's not necessarily a specific action. It's a demeanor. It's an attitude. Pride's a problem, and I, I agree. It's the impetus behind everything. But let's pick one action sin. A sin that's affected families and marriages and children and parents and, and businesses and churches and countries. You got an idea? Our words. I think our words do more damage than we could possibly fathom and that's why I think it's included in Paul's list of things we are no longer to do, and that's what we find in our, in our passage today. Let's just look at the first phrase, verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Any questions? <laughs> I love instruction like this. It's just like my dad. Stop it, okay? No, no more questions. Um, I want to keep this in our minds of false context here. Remember in verse 17 of chapter 4, he said, no longer live like the Gentiles do. In other words, don't walk like you used to walk. And he gives us some really important reasons to remember why we don't walk like that. One is we're not that person anymore, right? We're, we're something new. We, we're not alienated from God. We're not darkened in understanding. Our hearts are not hard and we're not callous to sin. That's what we were and that's what he said in chapter four uh, of our condition. But something's different now. We've been made new according to Paul and we have had our minds renewed and we're now wearing the life of Christ. And so if you want a positive negative reason why we don't do these things, it's because we're not who we used to be and we're something brand new. Remember this. Hopefully you've been through the series together with us. And so hey, he started out what seems like a very basic list of things that are different in us. He said, no longer are we supposed to lie but tell the truth. No longer sin in our anger. Last week we talked about stealing, and I know those seems all like elementary discussions, but they're, they're primary to Paul in his expression or reflection on what we are now in Christ. And what he adds to the list today is, is the idea of, a, of our mouths. In fact, his point is because of the gospel, we are to put away corrupt talk. That's that first phrase. Now, let's answer this question. What does Paul mean by corrupt talk? If you have a different version, like an NIV or something, it uses the word unwholesome for corrupt, and maybe that helps. It bro I think it broadens the definition just by a, a simple word. That's helpful. But the word actually means rotten, useless, or unprofitable. And not, now we got this thing really stretching out there about what kind of words we're not supposed to speak. If they're unprofitable words, wow, we're in trouble. If they're, if they're unwholesome words and rotten and useless, those are the kinds of words we're to not engage in. One writer, I think, describes it graphically as a rotten fish, right? Rotten fish can't nourish anyone and they're gonna make you sick. They smell bad and they ruin the experience for everybody, okay? So, so those are the kinds of words Paul says, we don't do, church. Put away the corrupt talk, not to engage in. If you and I were to take a break um, and wander over to the commons and sit down and grab a cup of joe, and I just looked you in the eye and said, hey, do you ever engage in unwholesome talk, unprofitable talk? You'd probably think like most people do, things like think profane, cursing, taking the Lord's name in vain, course talk, and certainly that's a part of it, and, and that's, that's the reason why I got um, a lot of soap when I was a kid. My dad was a whipper. My mom, I'm certain, had a contract with Ivory because she was, <laughs> she was a soap lady, and she was good at it, too. She wouldn't just put it in your mouth. She'd scrape it on my teeth. She'd leave it in there, 
And it didn't matter what kind of soap. She wasn't even like discriminate in that. She would pick, you know, this lava stuff your dad uses in the garage with pumice. That'll fix it. All right, I digress. But maybe when you think of unwholesome talk, you think profane things, language, cursing, taking the Lord's name in vain, and clearly that is a part of it. But the unwholesome idea that Paul has in mind has a very wide expression. Now, this is where we have to all get to the table, and it's going to feel very uncomfortable and, sadly to say, very familiar. Because what Paul has in mind here is, is things that sound like this, dishonest words or half-truth words, criticizing words, not, not critique. Some of our jobs are involved in critiquing, but criticizing, criticism, insults, name-calling, gossip, slander, undermining someone's reputation, Complaining, grumbling. I, I use this phrase, someone else invented it, but perfecting the enemy. That's the idea of talking about someone so poorly that you leave no room for the listener but to hate them too. They're just bad. It's shaping people's opinions with our words about others. Right? That is our culture. Welcome to the USA. It is our politics, it is our relationships, it is our social um, language. Now, by the way, this should be obvious. We don't just sin this way with our mouth. We sin this way with our computers, with our iPhones, with our pens. And this is where I get sarcastic a little bit, but isn't it a great thing that technology has invented a more sophisticated way for us to sin? Isn't that awesome? So now we have Twitter and Facebook, if that even matters anymore, or Instagram. I don't, I don't care whatever is out there that people want to just say something. And so we do. We're living in a soundbite world, and everybody wants to get their gun off. They just do. They have something to say and something they want to feel, and they want you to know about it. And so they say it, okay? Something they don't like, someone they don't like, something that they're emoting. And we have this immediate connection with thousands of people who will get from us a temporary feeling or at least a poorly thought out opinion. It just came out of me. What do you think's gonna happen? Well, sometimes you're just gonna be flat out wrong. With that kind of leverage, with that kind of mechanism to help you feel out loud to thousands of people, sometimes you're just gonna miss the mark by a mile. But most of the time, even if I believe the best in you, you're gonna be misunderstood. And you want to talk about the definition of unprofitable words? That's it. Miss, miss the point. Even our best intentions, we end up speaking these unprofitable, corrupt words. Now, when I was writing this, actually, this week, I felt the hair on the back of my neck start to stand up because it just irks me. It just begins to irk me a lot. Um, and, and to be honest with you, I'm not pointing just at the world. But clearly, the world has no other option. They do this. The church does this, and it drives me nuts. And I don't want you to come up here afterwards and start talking to me about the good of social media until you can prove to me the wins are greater than the losses. Because the losses are just brutal. Sound bites don't love. They don't teach, and they don't lead. How could they? It's not what they're for. They're meant to make a point and devastate someone else, we think. They're our version of drop the mic. Boom, nothing else to say, I win. I've said it, 140 characters, I win. That's what they're meant for. Paul says, do not, imperative, live like the Gentiles do. Jesus said, your commission, go into the world and make disciples of everybody. And let me just warm you up to the concept of discipleship and what it's like. Discipleship is loving the unlovely, and it is leading the unruly, otherwise we don't need it. Discipleship requires relationship. Our unwholesome words, as we've defined them here, however well-intentioned they may be, just don't justify their use. Because if they miss, if they don't understand, if we've gotten more distance and more proximity, we have done the opposite of what we intended. Everyone get it? 
That would be like justifying angry words. Like if you're just a really angry parent and you're justified angry because your kid's disobedient, two wrongs never make a right. So just because something's wrong out there and you use some wrong mechanism to confront it, you have not helped it. You've just distanced yourself from the people you're supposed to love. Does this make sense? Okay. Now, sometimes when I teach this stuff, I don't want to teach this stuff. Like a couple weeks ago, I talked to you about anger, and I thought, man, could somebody else do this one? Because that's me. If the Holy Spirit isn't running the store here, I, I'm that guy. And I'm glad that I'm no longer what I was, and I'm so glad that the Holy Spirit's changing me and has changed me over time. But there was a time in my life when I was more concerned about being right and winning than people. Now, you know what else is on my regret list. All those times I was right and nobody cared. Seems to be the perfect definition of unprofitable. I was right, but nobody's listening. Well, I'm looking at your faces and I see your nods and I go, well, they're with me, they're with me, you're tracking, so I don't need to beat that dead horse anymore. But we all got an issue with these unprofitable, unwholesome, corrupt, rotten, polluted words. It's in us, okay? So let me ask this question, why? Why are we so prone to use them? <laughs> We're looking at it, I'm watching your face, you go, man, that, yeah, that is ugly, oh yeah, that's probably bad. But we do it, so why? What, what motivates us? Let me give you three simple things. Clearly this is not exhaustive, but I think it will help shape some of our discussion. One is that we overvalue what we think, two is we undervalue others, and three, we have misplaced priorities. Let's deal with that first one. First of all, we overvalue our own thoughts and opinions. The word that I used in the beginning of our talk um, is the definition, is the, is the description of this problem. It's pride. Let's just face it. We overvalue ourselves. This is a scripture regarding that issue. Proverbs 14, 3, a fool's mouth lashes out with pride, but lips of the wise protect them. Proverbs 18, 2, a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinions. Paul talking to the church in Rome in chapter 12, verse 3, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but think with sober judgment. Sober judgment is about you. Look in the mirror and be honest about you. Assess yourself clearly so that what you say will be real and accurate. By the way, and this is not meant to just hurt you, but according to James, your tongue is the test of your faith. James 1, 26, if anyone thinks he is righteous but does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Somehow James connects our faith to our mouth. and said, if you can't bridle this, then how can you know anything about this? So somehow, how we manage our tongue that James brings up, that Paul says, we don't walk that way anymore. We don't walk like the Gentiles do anymore. We're a new creature in Christ, so we don't use unwholesome, corrupt, rotten, polluted words anymore. Somehow it's connected to true, legitimate conversion, like true faith. So, nobody I know, if I believe the best, tries to be wrong in what they say. I, I just don't see them. Like, that's my agenda today, to mislead to lie, they, they get caught up in something else. They are just so impassioned and impressed with their own thoughts and opinions that they don't even consider the possibility of what they could be missing. So therefore, with the immediacy of our tongue on every platform possible, we don't slow down to think or consider, we just express and emote, and therefore you have what the scriptures would call the fool. So we are quick to conclude that we're right about whatever the subject might be. So the conclusion seems obvious. Therefore, you get a piece of my mind. And out it comes. Criticism, gossip, slander, judgment, suspicion. Pride kills us with this. You might say to yourself, well, wait, somebody's got to do something, Tim. I mean, the, the stuff is just terrible out there. Somebody's got to say something. Let me, let me just take the pressure off of you of having to solve the problems. There might be something God's called you to engage in. I'm not telling you not to do that. But I know this is a better word. The Lord will fight for you. You only have to be silent. I'm not, I'm not worried about who wins. So... 
we're prone to overvalue our, our, ourselves, our own thoughts, but how about this? We're prone to, to speak rotten words because we undervalue others. Again, Proverbs 18, 13, if one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and his shame. In fact, that's just really the, the way to describe what we're really great at. We're quick to want to be heard and understood, but how slow are we to hear and understand? There's that old Native American proverb, before you judge a man, walk a mile in his moccasins. There, there's a real um, good truth to that. Part of our language needs to be affected by our understanding, a legitimate understanding of others. It has to be, right? When we choose profitable, unprofitable words, we are slandering someone. The question should come up to our mind, do we really know them at all? Have you ever tried to empathize? Do we walk a mile in their moccasins? Can we see how they could see something? Even if they're missing a few points, can we see at least how they get there? Here, here's what I'm trying to say. All I know is that relationship and love change what we do with our mouths. It always does. For instance, if uh, I decided to criticize your child and just label everything that I see in your child with, with no understanding and no empathy, no real getting to know you or your child at all, there'd be a drastic difference between my take and your take because you would fill in the accusation with love and understanding. That's just what we do. Nobody knows my kids like I do. I know how they can be misunderstood. I know how someone could judge them, but I'll fill in the blanks with love and loyalty. I won't fill it in with suspicion. I won't let somebody say, well, it's all scorched earth and it's all bad. Perspective helps us. And that's part of how we, I guess, are able to, to see our failure in this point because we, we really don't value others. We speak unwholesome words because of a decision, and I think this is a willful decision, a decision to be distant from others. That's the only conclusion, the only so what to corrupt words and unwholesome talk. It's because I've made a decision not to get close enough to you to say something different. So, you don't want to know how many times I will catch wind of some gossip or slander or complaint in our church. And beyond the fact that almost nobody obeys the Bible by going to the person they've got an issue with, I mean, that's biblical, go deal with it. Nobody wants to obey the Bible because they're too chicken to deal with stuff. So what they do is they gather with others who have no business knowing it and they start to talk about the issue. And so what happens is they talk about the issue not with love and loyalty, but with suspicion. They fill in all the blank spaces with bad stuff. That just happens. Paul writes to Titus, chapter three, speak evil of no one, period. Avoid quarreling, be gentle, and show p perfect courtesy towards all people. Seems pretty definitive, doesn't it? Like, doesn't it seem like it has a lot of gaps, a lot of room for other? Speak evil of how many people? Easy, nobody. Now, let me give you another reason why we're so prone to, to these unprofitable words. How about misplaced priorities? Let me ask you a question. How many times have you engaged in rotten words and have justified them because of truth? This is where we're going to all get caught. Paul, Paul has already addressed this issue of truth in, in our tongue in chapter 4, verse 15, you don't even need to look at it, but you'll, you'll know it. He tells us to speak the truth in, come on, that ain't good enough. Speak the truth in, okay, you already know. That is the qualifier and environment for how we speak. Speak truth in love. That's what he says. You don't speak truth without love. You don't love without truth. You speak truth in love, period. That's how he describes it for us. So let me, let me ask you this. What if, what if you could choose, Christian, to always be right? What, what if like, I could just give that to you? Like here's the pixie dust. You'll never be wrong the rest of your life. You could just be right. Would you, would you choose that? What if you could choose to always be liked? Like everyone's not gonna have a problem with you. You're just gonna be the great guy and you're never creating tension. You never see any problems. You're just the great guy. Would you want that? What if I suggested to you that you could choose to be like Jesus? And he, he 
spoke the truth and he loved? What if it wasn't one or the other? What if it had to be both? What if it is both? What if that's the only thing that should enter our conversations is truth and love? What if that was it? Here's the reality. There's no place for unprofitable words. Here's what we know. Our Savior is the truth. He said that of himself. And out of all the ways that Jesus could decide in a holy way to demonstrate the truth, he chose to wrap it in love. Right? You and I wouldn't know anything about truth at all if he didn't bring it to us in love. We are to wear the life of Christ. This is the new creature we put on. This is the clothing we wear. There is no other option. We don't manage truth and tell people to tough it out and take it. If it doesn't come with love, shut your mouth. And I don't hate to be too blunt about it, but that's the point. We are his bride putting on his likeness it's not enough to be right. It's not enough to have a point. Everybody thinks they're right and everybody has a point. It's not enough. If it isn't packaged in love, you're missing it. everything. Love must be the environment for truth. I'm gonna read a paraphrase to you, 1 Corinthians 13. Just listen. If I speak with human eloquence, angelic ecstasy, but don't love, I'm nothing but a creaking of a rusty gate. <clears throat> If I speak God's word with power, revealing all its mysteries and making everything plain as day, and if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I don't love, I'm nothing. <clears throat> if I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, or what I do, I am bankrupt without love. Do you understand the absolute eternal connection between truth and love, they cannot be separated. Otherwise, you lose. Love can't be seen without truth, and truth can't be seen without love. They have to go together. All it does when we navigate with one or the other is divide ourselves from people. That's all that can happen. I got the truth, and the only people that are gonna care about what you say are the people who already agree with what you think. You're not moving the needle anywhere. And if you love, you never move anybody to truth that saves them. You're just stuck. You're not helpful whatsoever. We don't have the option for unwholesome, corrupt, rotten words. Truth and love. So let me ask you this. What are we supposed to do about this? Paul gives us several things that we can pr practically do for others. But let me give you something that you can do for yourself before we go on. Care for your heart. Let me use an illustration from Jesus' life in Matthew chapter 12. Uh, Jesus was healing people as he did. And the religious leaders who didn't know Jesus, didn't care about Jesus, were threatened by Jesus, would just make accusations, corrupt, unwholesome language towards Jesus. And they attributed his work to Satan. They would just basically say, "That's the devil's doing that, not, not God. And so Jesus makes a point to his disciples to say this, that you can observe the kind of tree a tree is by the kind of fruit it bears. Remember this? Bad tree, bad fruit, good tree, good fruit. And then Jesus says this, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Okay, I need you to listen to this. Nothing comes out of our mouths that isn't first nurtured in our hearts. It doesn't just happen. Unwholesome unprofitable, corrupt words don't just happen. They've already been growing in the uncaringness of our hearts to have them come out of our mouths. So if you're caught, if you know, if you feel conviction in your soul that, man, I did that, I said that, I am that. Well, the problem is way, way, way a long time ago because it's growing in the soil of your heart someplace else before it comes out of your face. So, it is not an overstatement to say that the most important thing we can do in our life is to guard our hearts. So let me be practical. Don't read the wrong things that fan fear. Because if you read the wrong things that fan fear and not faith, you will speak of fear and not faith. That's what you'll do. Don't talk to the wrong people who promote hate. 
Don't listen to them. Don't listen to the wrong leader who sells you hope without a savior. There is only one hope in the planet and his name is Jesus. There is another option. So you don't have to get ramped up or worried when the wrong person says the wrong thing. Who cares? You don't have to emote and express yourself. You have a savior. Proverbs 4 says, above all, guard your heart for everything you do, everything you do flows from it. Pretty simple, right? Guard your heart, first and foremost, because everything else comes from that. Okay. Look at the second half of it. Let's read all of 29 again. Paul gives us some real specific things to do here. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may be give grace to those who hear. Three things he seems to say here. Words that build up others, words that fit the occasion, and words that give grace. That seems to be pretty clear what Paul is saying for us. And by the way, you should circle this word and point arrows to it, color it in yellow, red ink, whatever you want to do, okay? Fold over the page so you never miss this, the word only. (laughs) It limits our language. Share only words that build up others, right, that fit the occasion, that give grace to people. If all you did was major on those three things, you'd have plenty to talk about. What are words that build others up? Do I need even to tell you? You ever been built up by somebody? Have you ever been encouraged? You, you, you know, when you needed it, like the timing's perfect, you thought you had failed or you thought that it wasn't good enough or you're wondering about your place or whatever and someone says to you, hey man, just I want you to know when you did that, it blessed my heart. Oh, I can keep going at least for another week. I think I can. Telling someone you appreciate them, the unnoticed telling people you love them, be kind and gentle. I mean, that is the building up words. That's the command that we are to be with one another. When I first got in ministry, this is actually before I got in ministry. I wanted to be in ministry, but I wasn't in ministry. And I had a friend, um, he, he was a pastor, he was a youth pastor, good guy, seminary grad. He had all the bells and whistles, of which I had none. He said to him, hey, would you like to teach on Sunday? I went, oh, wow, yeah. I was terrified. So this was months in advance, and I read, and I read, and I read. I read books. I read tons of books, and wrote, and wrote, and wrote, and I thought I was ready. My gun was loaded. I got up there and preached an eight-minute sermon. (laughs) And if you know me, I mean, it was, how do I, the funnel was about that big. So, So I had tried to glean as much as I could, but I'm so stinking intense that in eight minutes, I went, done. There, take it. I sort of don't remember what I said, but I was sincere as sunshine. It just happened. And, and, and maybe me, I, if I was assessing me, I'd come up and say, hey, man, you just screwed that up, really. You didn't even have a point. That's not what Rich did. Rich said, hey, man, it was, it was quick. And you could tell you really meant it. <laughs> we, we got to making a point later. There was, he could have ripped me to shreds. He did nothing but build me up. We all have stories like that. Only the kind that build up. Share words that fit the occasion. Proverbs 15, 23, a man takes joy in a fitting reply and how good is a timely word. Let me just tell you the obvious. If you're gonna share a timely word, it requires awareness. Can you see when other people are hurting? Can you? Do you even care when people are afraid or depressed? Can you look them in the eye and know there's something missing? Can you see when they're weak and they're worn or when they're happy, when they're rejoicing and celebrating? Are you good at it? Because you should be. Because if you, if you don't even care about being aware of whether people are at then there's no possible way for you to share a timely word. Let me just encourage you to work at it because the words that Paul says to share with one another are words that are always right on time. Do you know the perfect timing words? Like, I was so bummed. And you said that, and it's better. Fitting the occasion seems to imply preparedness, awareness, and willingness 
to tell someone what they need to hear. That requires looking them in the eye and knowing their heart, right? Here's another thing that Paul says we're to do with our words, words that give grace. These are the kinds of words that stop the bleeding. Grace could be uh, forgiving words, like because we're all sinners, we're in homes of sinners, our parents are sinners, our children are sinners, everything is messed up that way. Inevitably, every week we have things we have to forgive one another, right? Do it. Those are grace words. I forgive you, man, I release you, you're free. I don't wanna think about it and you don't either, so let's just go, let's move on. Let's live in this grace that Jesus died to give us. They're forgiving words, they're also reminding words. Every one of us in this room knows somebody, if it isn't ourselves, someone who's sinned against God. Maybe in a more gory, scandalous way, more public way. And these people can't pick their head up. And at this point, Satan does his best work, right? He whispers in the ear of this sinner, like, how, how dare you? How could you? How could you call yourself a Christian? You know the gang tackle that, that the enemy does when we fail, when we sin, and start to question whether what's real and what's real in you or whatever? Can God really forgive that? Man, that's over the line, isn't it? Here are these grace words. Grace words are life preservers to the beaten down. That's what keeps them going. Tell them how much God loves them. Tell them how much his forgiveness reaches them. Tell them that there is nothing that can separate them from the love of Christ Jesus. Nothing. Not your stupid decisions, not your willful, your willful efforts. Nothing will separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing. Tell them that. Those are grace words. Tell them that God isn't finished with them. He's just getting started. And sometimes when God gets started, he gets started when we're at our worst, right? Sometimes he has to take us there. Tell them that. Tell them that you love them. Tell them that you don't judge them, that you're, you're not the one sitting in the seat of judgment, that apart from the grace of God, you could do that and far worse. Tell them that. Tell them about grace. Speak it in love. Do you want to know our greatest motivation in the world? Look at verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Here's our motivation. Because our rotten words grieve the Holy Spirit. They grieve him. It blows my mind that the reason Paul tells us that we're to control our tongues isn't some law. He doesn't like, do it or else. He boils it all down to this very personal, very relational thing and says, listen, your Holy Spirit, your God, it affects him. The person of the Holy Spirit, he grieves it. He appeals to our relationship, this personal relationship with God. And it should make sense because he loves you. Parents, don't you grieve everything that hurts your kid? The greatest parent is the father. And someone once said this, the deeper the love, the deeper the grief. So if God's love is deep, if God's love is great, if it is the greatest definition of love the world has ever known, then I would imagine his grief goes deeper than any grief you've ever known. It grieves him. Our motivation not to speak corrupt words and in wholesome ways is because it grieves him. Let, let me suggest to you this as well, Christian, brother to brother, sister to sister. The Holy Spirit grieves it because he loves the one you're mad at. Not just you. This isn't just about you. He loves everybody. So when you're warring with a sister or a brother in Christ, remind yourselves that it grieves the Spirit because he, he loves them too. And the last thing should be obvious. He grieves it because it's sin. Sin caused man to be separated from God. Sin was the reason God's wrath was poured out on Jesus on the cross 2,000 years ago. And to me, it's just so interesting that every time we get done with one of these really pragmatic things, everything boils down to the first and the second greatest commandment. It's not complicated. Love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. You want to figure this out? You want to control your tongue? You want to speak helpful, profitable words? Then love God more than anything else and make certain you love others. 
Speak that truth in love. Here's what I know. In our culture that's lost its mind with its tongue, we need to pray for help, right? Let's do that together. Father God, would you help us? Would you help us by increasing our awareness of our mouths and our writing, our thinking? God, I pray that you would quicken our spirit to be sensitive to the pride in our hearts that thinks we have a right to say things without love or to take some grand position of love without truth, that those, those things aren't our option. We are to be a people of truth who love. That's it. And to only speak such a word that builds others up, that's fitting for the occasion, it is grace to them. God, give your church the strength, give it the will, the conviction to be a place um, of those kinds of words, helpful words. We need your help, Holy Spirit, so we pray it in Jesus' name, amen.